Fritz Pickard. I thank my God on every remembrance of you. And Hamilton Chapel. You all collectively have been so very kind to me over the years and have always made me feel welcome here. And I am very, very impressed with the fact that, that you've created this culture in this church of togetherness and kindness. So well done you. <clears throat> I appreciate all the feedback that I got on yesterday's message both here in the room and online, including comments about the length of my beard. You know, I do know what I look like. David asked me the other day how long I was going to let it grow. I said that I'm shooting for somewhere before between uh, Reformed and ZZ Top. So, <laughs> Yesterday, if you came away with nothing else from the lecture yesterday, I hope that you came away with the realization that it is a remarkable, truly astounding, amazing gift that God has given you by making you part of His church. We established yesterday that the church does belong to Him. Christ is in the enterprise of building His church, and the gates will not prevail against it. I told you that whether you say ecclesia or you say church, the derivation of both of those words is the outcalled who belong to the Lord. So no matter how you slice it, it begins with God giving particular people to Jesus Christ, Him coming to the planet and dying for those particular people, and then giving them eternal life as a result of the finished work of Jesus Christ. In other words, you were passive in that process, and therefore he has given you the remarkable, astounding gift of being part of his church. Yeah. Knowing all of that, it is astounding that people can take it for granted. And I get that there's been two years of COVID, and I get the politics of COVID, and I get that all the churches went online. Now, speaking of that, yesterday I did hammer away at the idea of the Internet and churches on the Internet. And I did say, but let me emphasize it here again today, I'm no enemy of the Internet. I've prospered by the Internet for the last 20 years. I'm no enemy of the internet, but the internet is not a true substitute for church. Because church, by definition, by biblical definition from Jesus our Lord, church involves a great deal of togetherness and congregating, which is why we're called a congregation, a lot of one anothering, a lot of taking care of each other and interactions that simply cannot take place via the internet. Yesterday I said that you cannot effectively pastor people over the internet. But, having said all that, I understand that there are people, shut-ins, who prosper greatly from the internet. And I'm not denigrating that idea. I'm glad the internet exists the same way that preachers used to make record albums of their sermons, the same way that they would appear on radio or on TV. The internet is just the latest communication vehicle by which we get to spread the gospel, and I'm happy for that. But the internet has natural limitations to it that mean that the internet is never a fully sufficient substitute for church itself. Yesterday we talked about the church in a sort of global way. Today I want to hone in on the importance, the necessity of the local church. Now it would be really easy for me to be really cynical about the local church because I grew up in church. From the time I was born, my parents started taking me to church. And I've been in everything from fairly orthodox churches to a church out in California that Tom and I were part of that became a true, genuine cult of personality. Emphasis on the word cult. 
And so I've seen all aspects of the church. I've seen, I've seen people lie to each other in church. I've seen people abuse each other in church. I would say I've been robbed in church. By a preacher who said, by the way, what's the point of having sheep if you can't shear them? I've been mentally tormented in church. I've been wrongfully accused in church. And ultimately, I've been scattered by the church. It would be real easy for me to be really cynical about the church. And I love the church. Because I understand that the church belongs to Jesus Christ and I love him. Therefore, I am called to love his people. I am called to love the body of the church. I love the idea of church. I love the concept of church. I love everything about the church. If it weren't for the people, he lets into his church. And that's why there's so much instruction in the Bible about how we, as a gathering of human beings, are supposed to treat each other. That's why the Bible puts so much emphasis on forgiving each other and caring for each other. Because Christ forgave us for all of our foibles, therefore that becomes our inspiration in forgiving each other. Now, I have said for many, many years, why did God have to give rules and laws to human beings? Because he started doing that right from the beginning. Start with Ten Commandments. And then ordinances aplenty after that. Why did he have to do that? Because these things that he instructs us in just don't come natural to us. Otherwise, he wouldn't have to mention it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, remember to breathe. You're, you're going to do that. But he has to tell you, learn to forgive. He has to tell you, learn unity with one another. He has to tell you how to love each other. Because you're just not going to naturally do that. Look, the simple truth is, and I'm sure that every preacher in the room is going to agree with me, every church is a gathering, an ecclesia of sinners. Hopefully converted sinners, but you have to recognize going in that you're among a bunch of people who are in their flesh battling their natural proclivities. Wow, that was a road bump right there. That was just... Battling their natural proclivities toward their own flesh, their own sinful nature. Romans 7 certainly looms large here. There simply is no perfect church. If you're out there searching for the perfect church and they let you in it, it's not perfect anymore. There are no perfect churches by virtue of the fact that, well, we're in it. And we're going to carry our natural sinful tendencies into the church. No church gets everything right. Trouble happens in the church because the church is populated by humans and their fleshly tendencies. One of the things that I really appreciate about the New Testament epistles, all of which, by the way, were written to local churches. That's how important local churches are, biblically speaking. But one thing that I really appreciate about Paul's letters to all these local churches is that he writes to the Corinthians two letters. There's probably a third that we don't have. And in those letters, he's just going through their problems and their difficulties with each other. And he's listing their problems one after the other. And at the end of the second letter says, and I'll deal with the rest when I get there. This was a church in trouble. But I appreciate the fact that at no point did God ever say, well, now you're not a church. There's still a church, just a really troublesome, messed up church. If you are indeed a church that belongs to Jesus Christ, then yesterday I said that your prime objective, obviously, is the glory of God. But along the way, in glorifying God, there are things that the church is called to do. Things like evangelizing, 
things like the communion of the saints, things like one anothering, taking care of each other, loving, unity. I spent a lot of time yesterday talking about unity. Well, let me add another wrinkle to it. Let me add what Paul refers to as the ministry of reconciliation. What a marvelous phrase that is. Because the ministry of reconciliation is all about telling men and women, boys and girls, sinners all, telling them how they can be reconciled with their maker eternally. It just doesn't get more important than that. So what we are called to do as a church, according to 2 Corinthians 5, again, Paul writing to this messed up Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 18, and boy, that must be a record because I just finished my introduction, so I feel good about that. The folks from GCA are feigning shock back there. 2 Corinthians 5. I'm going to read 18 to 21 so that we can understand this ministry of reconciliation. Now, all of these things are from, God, are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and then gave us the ministration of reconciliation. We are the ones who go out and tell the good news of the fact that God, as we've been hearing a lot in this conference, God reconciled people to himself through Jesus Christ because there was no one, humanly speaking, who could accomplish that work. There was no human being who could stand in the gap between God and sinful men. And so God took it upon himself to accomplish what we could never accomplish and thereby reconcile us, measly little sinful little stupid little boneheaded us, and reconciled us to himself. And then gave the church the responsibility the ministry, to go out and tell that, to go out and preach that. And so Paul calls that the ministry of reconciliation. Then Paul defines what that is, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That's the uh, mode of reconciliation because our problem is we could not be righteous enough we could not be holy enough to approach the God who is encased in a light that no man approaches and there's nothing we can do about it so he had to do something and thank God he did and then he forgave us for all our trespasses now I don't know about you I don't know if you're anything like me I hope to God you're not but I wake up in the middle of the night remembering the places I've been and the things I've done, and it scares me because I know me. And there's no way I was going to be able to reconcile myself to God. So he, in complete sovereign majesty, did everything necessary to reconcile the two of us, and he accomplished that through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. I did nothing. I'm passive in all that. That's amazing grace. That's astounding grace that he would do that for someone like me. He is not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed them to us. When Paul says us, in writing to the Corinthians, who is he talking to? He's talking to the church. He's talking to a local church. And he's explaining this ministry of reconciliation that God, having accomplished all of this on our behalf, has then committed to us the word of reconciliation. And so we are out there begging people to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. As though we were God, making an appeal through us. And so we beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That is one of the primary functions of the church. 
how much the first two days here at the conference did we hear the church in the world referred to as the modern circus? Because there's really nothing else to compare it to. You go online and you watch so-called church services, and it's little more than a circus. It's all falderall, and they are ignoring the primary directive from God to what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be declaring because we have been assigned by a sovereign, by our boss, we have been assigned to go out and preach the word of reconciliation. If you're in a church for any length of time and nobody has told you how to be reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, that church is not doing their job. Because we exist for a very specific purpose the glory of God. We exist for the purpose of helping men and women, boys and girls, be reconciled to that God. So Paul could say, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, that we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Because he made him who knew no sin to be sent on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If I know anything about me, one thing I know I'm not is righteous. I can't claim righteousness. And yet through Christ, through the ministry of reconciliation, we become the righteousness of God in him. Not just righteous, not just the righteousness of Jim. The righteousness of God. You just don't get more righteousified than that. You don't accomplish greater righteousness than the righteousness of God. And so God in his sovereign power has declared through Jesus Christ that he is going to save some people and bring them to himself. And that is what the church is supposed to be proclaiming on a nonstop basis. And we turned it into the circus. We turned it into showbiz. Does any church need a smoke machine? Our local megachurch, GCA could survive for the next five years on what our megachurch has invested in lighting. What's the priority? It's astoundingly good news in both parts of it, that we get to be recipients of this reconciliation and that we get to be proclaimers of it. All I'm stressing again is the remarkable privilege of being part of his church. It's a really truly marvelous gospel that we get to preach and so the activity of the church is to preach the gospel of Christ so that sinners are converted toward God and they are delivered from the wrath of God himself, that wrath that is to come. And so we are calling sinners to repentance. I'm sure by now you know what repentance means. In the simplest form, all it means is to turn 180 degrees. You're going this direction, and I'm tired of your faces. I'm going to go, I'm going to go this direction instead, because let's be honest, these are more pleasant faces. That Activity of turning one direction to the other is essentially all that repentance is. Turning 180 degrees from yourself, your flesh, your desires, your wants to God and his desires and his wants and his plan for you and your life. One of my favorite phrases is, you should take sides with God against yourself. Now, Theologically speaking, I'm sure that everybody in this room would agree that God is sovereign. We would agree that it is God who does the choosing. It's God's plan that's being worked out in his church today. And the Bible certainly says that repeatedly. But the means, the method that he uses in calling men and women, boys and girls to himself is the preaching of the word. And that's why Paul put so much emphasis on preach the word, because that activity of preaching the word is the method through which God is calling sinners to himself through Jesus Christ. And so every church that is preaching anything else except the word is actually doing no favors to their congregation. It doesn't matter how entertaining they are. 
Doesn't matter how erudite they are. Doesn't matter how well dressed they are. If they're not sticking to the text of the Bible, they're not helping to save anybody, and they're certainly not involved in the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, local church matters because that's how God does it. This is God's plan. This is God's enterprise. And that means local church is really genuinely important to God. And if it's that important to God, it certainly ought to be important to us. I get it. The last two years have been tough. I get it. Everybody went online and shut their doors, with a few exceptions. I get why you did that. You did it in the best interest of your congregation and hoping that you could help them stay healthy. I get it. That's over. It's time for the church to reunite so that they can continue to function as the church, but the church has become placid. The church isn't ready to fight back. The church has spent way too much time agreeing with the government, as I think our former speaker just told us. I just blanked on your name, Jamie. I'm sorry about that. Look, I'm 66 up here. I'm working with a really old brain, okay? The church, unfortunately, has listened to what the government has said and has bought into all the rationales, the reasons, and the excuses for why we ought to stop congregating. And yet, essential to what the church is, is this idea of congregating. Because there are just certain things, certain requirements of the church that cannot be accomplished without congregating. And I emphasized yesterday that the powers of darkness of this world have infiltrated the church in order to get the church to obey commands from the government. And here again, I'm corresponding with what Jamie just said. We are listening to the government more than we seem to be listening to our Bibles. And we're the church! We're supposed to be doing things God's way even if that means walking into a furnace. Look, let's be honest, sometimes local church is messy. I get it, I agree. But look, if God doesn't work through sinners, he's got nobody to work through. He can only work through we human beings and our fleshly proclivities. Church is messy. Sometimes church is like triage, just busy patching up the wounded and the world weary. It's just as true that sometimes local church is sanctuary. Local church can be a place of sanity that brings us what Paul refers to as that peace that passes understanding in the midst of a really crazy and stupid world. You watch the news these days and you just think, what is going on? How insane is this, and who's making these decisions? The solution to that, just like the solution to the many ways that the government is trying to divide us and separate us and make us fight against each other, the solution to all of that is the church. There is no other organization on planet Earth that carries that message of unity and reconciliation and care and, oh, I love that word, sanctuary. Philippians 2, 3 to 5, Paul again instructs the church what they're to be like. He knows that human beings are naturally fleshly and egocentric. So he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty or vain conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Have you ever heard a sentence more contrary to the way the world works? Because everything in the world is me first. Let me tell you about me. Okay, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? Me, it's all about me. In 
the church, Paul says, regard one another as more important than yourselves. This is part of that unity that we talked about so much yesterday. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others and have this attitude in you and in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice again that these instructions are never based on you or your ability to do it. The inspiration for these things, just like the inspiration for forgiveness yesterday, was because Christ forgave you. Because he did that, now forgive each other. Here it is again. Christ took on this attitude of humility that he carried all the way to the ignominious cross. If he could humble that, if he could humble himself that far for somebody like you, then certainly you ought to be able to look out for the concerns of others and not merely just the concerns of yourself. And let's be honest, if you are in a congregation where everybody in the room has your best interest at heart, you want to be there. That's a good place to be. That's a healthy place to be in this sin-soaked world. You want to be somewhere where you know people care about you and love you. Because if you're surrounded by people like that, who know who you are and where you are, you can't fall through the cracks. You can't go hungry. You can't go naked. They're, they're going to give you what you need. Okay, so for most of this morning, I just want to talk about the language that the Bible uses to describe the local church because the language that the New Testament writers use to describe the church helps us understand how God sees the church, what God's intention is for the church. Paul and all the other New Testament writers use these word pictures, metaphors, to describe the church. For instance, when writing to Timothy, Paul's son in the ministry, Paul refers to the church as the household of God and the pillar and support of the truth. So what's supposed to be going on in the church? The telling of the truth. How do you know the truth? How do you know you're telling the truth? Preach the word. It's all very circular. It all comes back to the same concept, that it's a church that belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has given you his word. Therefore, in order to accomplish the ministry of reconciliation, you preach the word of God, not your ideas, not your opinions, not your entertainment ideas, that you preach the word of God because the church is meant to be the pillar of truth. That word pillar means that we uphold the truth. And that again, I know I'm harping on it. I know several people have harped on it the last couple of days. But that's why it is just so criminal, so truly demonic, to see the church become yet another entertainment venue. Yet another YMCA. To see the church become competitive for your disposable income. If they give you enough services and take care of your kids and have classes for all the other stuff, and then, and then if they also entertain you on Sundays and they do big showbiz for you, if they do all that, then they can get your entertainment dollar out of you because they're entertaining you. But the church is supposed to be the ground and the pillar of truth. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, I am writing these things to you hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how you should act in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. There's just no ambiguity there. Paul identifies the church of the living God as the very household of God and then defines it as the pillar and the support of truth. The biblical language describing the church is that we are meant to be family. Yesterday I defined the word kind for you and told you that it comes to us from the old English word kin, kinfolk. We're meant to be kin to one another, to be family to each other. And that family language permeates the New Testament epistles. For instance, in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, Paul says, for you are all sons of God. We're all children of God. Pretty obvious family example. He's the father. We're the kids. 
Now, I have two kids. My daughter was here with me yesterday. And for the rest of her life, no matter what she does, no matter where she goes, I'm the only father she gets. Too bad for her, she gets me. She never gets to have another biological father. I'm her only father. God understands that family, that family relationship. He understands that there is no closer relationship than parent and child. God had at his access all kinds of relationships he could have used. He could have said, I'm your great uncle and you're my distant cousin. He could have said, I'm the all-omnipotent master of time, space, and reality, and you're nothing to me. But instead, he took one of the most intimate human relationships, that of parent and child, and said that we, because we are born through Jesus Christ, are now sons of God, children of God. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And there is neither Jew or Greek, there's neither slave or free, there's, either, there's neither male nor female because you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's that unity that I pounded away at yesterday. Because there is no social strata in Christ. There is no racial difference in Christ. There is nothing that is to divide human beings in Christ, in the church. There's neither Jew or Gentile, free or slave. Can you imagine in the two-tiered Roman society where everybody was either a free man or a slave, the church comes along and says, okay, those differences don't count anymore. That was absolutely mind-boggling to the people who were receiving this. There's neither male nor female. We're all one in Jesus Christ. Paul also calls this amalgam of men and women, Jews and Gentiles, free and slave. He refers to them as God's household and as a building, a temple, being built by God where every individual in his building is placed by God in the exact place where he's supposed to be so that all of us as stones build up this grand temple that God is describing. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, that's us, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom also are being built together, in whom you also are being built together, into the dwelling of God in the Spirit. Do you understand what Paul is saying here? What is the importance? What is the value of the church? The church is a gathering of individuals called by God before the foundation of the world, given to the Son so that the Son could have his ecclesia, who he is going to preserve and forgive and take into eternity with him. And because of all that, there is no division. There's unity between us. And we are all being built and structured by God into the temple. Now, in the Old Testament, the purpose of the temple is that was the place where human beings met with God. It wasn't in you. Instead, you had to go to where the temple was. And then at the temple, there would be sacrifices to God. Before the temple, there was the, the uh, tabernacle in the wilderness and the holiest place. And only one man ever got to go into the holiest place, and then only once a year, and then only if he was wearing the right clothing. Then he got to go in and commune with God, and then if God accepted their sacrifices, they would see the pillar of God come down and rest on the Holy of Holies. But if you were just your average, everyday Israelite, you don't get to go in there. You don't get to go commune with God. 
You're standing outside, hoping that the sovereign power of God doesn't kill you like it often did. And yet in the New Testament, because of the finished work of Christ, we the church are told that we collectively are now the temple of God. And then Paul defines it for us as saying that we are all being built together into the dwelling of God through his spirit. The spirit of God dwells in his church, the collection of people that God has given to his son. How important does that make church? It's invaluable. Greg Wren, you got to be in the church of Jesus Christ. Can you believe it? I know you. And you get to be in the... He's my twin, by the way. Every time that he comes and preaches at GCA, he refers to himself as my twin. Stop. Tom Newman, you get to be part of the temple of God where erring, fallen sinners get to unite with the everlasting majesty and astounding forgiveness and sacrifice of God himself. Do you deserve it? No. Grace! That's why you're in the church. You're in the church because God has been phenomenally good to you. And I'm going to say again what I've been saying this whole time, which is don't take that for granted. You're in the church of Jesus Christ. It's astounding. Peter uses that same architectural language to describe the church. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by the people, but he is choice and precious in the sight of God, which is why Paul, in the, in the Ephesian segment that I just read for you, that he would say that Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. The entire building is built up on that stone. He is the living stone who was rejected by the people, but he is choice and he is precious in the sight of God. And then you also, here's where you enter into that scenario, you are also living stones and you're being built up as a spiritual house. And then he goes on and adds, for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What's the priest do? What's the point of the priesthood? In the Old Testament, you have prophets, priests, and kings. The kings are supposed to rule according to the law of God. The prophets are the ones who would speak the word of God to the people. They would hear from God and then go tell the people, this is what God says. But the priests were the ones who would stand between God and man and make intercession, as Roger was talking about last night. They were the ones who could sacrifice to God on behalf of the people. And yet Peter is telling us that as we're being built up into this spiritual temple, that the types and shadows of the Old Testament temple are being carried out into the New Testament. Not only are we the temple where the sacrifices of God happen, but that we collectively become the priests who are allowed to sacrifice to God. Grace. And then Paul is going to tell us that the most reasonable sacrifice we can bring to God is ourselves. It is our body bringing ourselves, pouring ourselves out on what we claim to believe, putting our bodies on the line for what we say we believe. I don't know who it is who said it last night, but I agree completely. One of the reasons that we never shut our doors, and I'm not trying to shame anybody by saying that. We, we just didn't. And part of the reason that we didn't was because, oh, God's sovereign. Oh, yeah, that's why. Um, which means he's in charge of disease. And our attitude from the beginning was, uh, if he's in charge of viruses, why would we stop praising and worshiping that God, giving him his necessary worship? Why would we stop doing that for fear of a disease that he's in charge of? So we just kept worshiping him. Two years later, we're still here. No damage was done to us.
the church, I don't even remember how I got off on that tangent. But I just wandered away from my notes and there I was. Oh yeah, I remember. If God is that sovereign, then shouldn't you in fact lay your body on the line? I mean, if he's that in charge, then of course you can trust him with your health, with your finances, with your family, with your job. The first time that you hear a doctor say, cancer, God's got it. God knew that was coming. There's no surprise to God. And so you can trust him in every aspect, which is why it's necessary to not only say you believe him, but to actually believe him. To actually put your body on the line, that is a sacrifice that Paul calls reasonable. The church is referred to frequently as a flock of sheep that belong to the great shepherd. That sheep-shepherd analogy runs all the way through the New Testament. But perhaps my favorite of those sheep-shepherd passages is in Hebrews 13. Right at the very benediction of the book, right at the very end. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus Christ our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do His will. There's a sovereign phrase. We can't do His will. We're not capable of doing His will unless He also gives us the ability to do His will. So He's going to give us all good things, every good thing, so that we can accomplish His will and he is working in us that which is pleasing in his own sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. There's that shepherd-sheep analogy. Now, if you know anything at all about shepherding, any shepherds in the room? Anybody? Okay. I mean actual sheep. I mean, yeah, shepherding is a dirty job. Tough job. Usually when you're shepherding, they're not your sheep. And, of course, we find that consistently through the Bible. The sheep belong to Jesus Christ. He's the great shepherd. We're just under shepherds trying to take care of some of the sheep. But sheep, boy, the qualities of sheep, you've probably heard this a thousand times, but sheep have no natural defense system. They have no way to fight back. They're just open for the prey, any carnivore that comes after them, they have no way of protecting themselves. They need a shepherd. They need a protector. So it's not a mistake that Jesus would be referred to as the shepherd with everything that is entailed in that shepherd language. He is our guide. He takes us into safe pastures. He leads us by still waters. He protects us, keeps us in the sheepfold, keeps the wolf away from us. He is the one who is providing for us all the good things necessary so that we can accomplish the will of God. That's all part of that sheep-shepherd analogy. And here the church is referred to as sheep. As we saw yesterday, we are Christ's body. I went into some length about that. But we're all part of one another. We're the singular body. We're united by that one spirit. And then most intimately, and perhaps my favorite of the analogies of the New Testament, the church is even referred to and pictured as the bride for whom Christ died. A moment ago I talked about father and child, and I said that's one of the most intimate relationships, the most emotional of all human relationships, is husband and bride. It doesn't get more emotionally impactful than that relationship. And yet Jesus would refer to us as his bride. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, again, that Corinthian church, and yet Paul used this language, he said, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. In Ephesians 5.25, in the context of urging husbands to love their wives, Paul draws that analogy. 
between husbands and wives and the emotional love and support that goes between them and then connects that to Christ and his church. Ephesians 5, starting at verse 28, says, So husbands, they ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies, because he who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourished it and he cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are parts of his body. And for this reason... A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's reaching all the way back to the early parts of Genesis and the unity between Adam and Eve, and then says to us, and this mystery is great because I'm speaking in reference to Christ and the church. As we were hearing the relationship between the husband and wife and the necessity for the husband to care for and protect and provide for his wife, we would all say, yes, that's, that's an ideal marriage. That's the way it's supposed to work. And yet Paul not only points out that the two become one, there's that unity again, but then makes it very clear that he's talking about Christ and his church. So the language, the analogies that the New Testament uses to describe the church is all this language of intimacy and all this language of unity and all this language of relationship and all this language of one anothering. And not to put too fine a point on it, those are the things that you can't do over the internet. It takes actually being in the body with each other to accomplish those things. Here's the point. If the church is so central to God's purpose, which certainly we see in history, we see it in the gospel, we see it in the language of the Bible, if, if it's that central to God's purpose, and if God uses this kind of language to refer to his church, then it certainly ought to be very central to our lives. It's not something that we can take haphazardly. It is, in fact, the very ground of our hope that we are one day going to eternally be with our husband. Don't you love Revelation 19? Don't you love the wedding supper of the Lamb? I want to be there. I mean, get your reservation in. I want to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. That language all speaks of this kind of unity between Christ and his church and between us and each other. Attending the local church is just practical to a fully functioning Christian life. It's putting your body on what you claim to believe. Romans 12, I referred to this earlier. The first two verses say, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and a holy sacrifice. Throughout the Old Testament, there were animals being sacrificed. There were constant sacrifices. In fact, there was, from the Holy of Holies, from the Tent of Meeting, there was a trench dug in the dirt because of the amount of blood that was poured out on a constant basis. Same thing in the temple, just constant, nonstop blood, blood, blood. Sacrifice of animals, slicing animals open, and the nonstop pouring out of blood. And I've been asked so many times, why so much blood in the Old Testament? And the answer is, because there's so much sin in the Old Testament. And the wages of sin is death. And the temple stood as a testimony to constant death, 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 death. Because there was so much sin. But then Christ comes and makes that once for all finished sacrifice for sin. And having done that, we are then called to bring our bodies not as a dead sacrifice, but as a living sacrifice bring it to God, bring it to Christ, because he, because Paul writes, our holy sacrifice of our living bodies is acceptable to God. And then he says, the NASB says, spiritual, I prefer the King James, that is your reasonable service of worship. It's only sensible. Once you get a concept of what God has done for you, 
Once you understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, once you understand the eternal plan of God that he rendered before the foundation of the world, it's only sensible that you would put your body on the line for him. That you would make that reasonable sacrifice. It's no fair to get up and say, I can't do church today. I'm tired. I stayed out late last night. Partied a little too hard last night. Can't go to church today. It's not convenient. It's not meant to be convenient. Do you hear the word sacrifice? Yeah, that's right. Sacrifice is not convenient. Sacrifice is putting your body on the line for what you claim to believe. I'm nearly done. Elder Wren, soon-ish. Okay. He's so much bigger than me that I really worry about offending him. And so on. Here's how the household, the family of God ought to behave. You know, for the last two days I've been talking about unity and I've been talking about the one anothering that we do with each other and I have purposefully held back on the concept of love. I wanted to kind of close up with this idea because it is absolutely essential to Christianity. You will notice that Jesus did not say by this will all men know that you are my disciples. He did not say they'll know you're my disciples because you've got every jot and tittle of the law correct. He didn't say, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, by the fact that, boy, you know your doctrine inside and out, and you can beat people over the head with it. The one characteristic that he held out as an example, as a demonstration, that we know him, is how we love one another. How we care for each other. Hebrews 13.1 is a very, very short verse that just says, let love of the brethren continue. That's a directive. Just let love of the brethren continue. Care about each other. Again, to put probably too fine a point on it, you can't do that over the internet. You can't do that when you're sitting at home drinking your coffee and you decide to tune into a church service and then stop it and take a break and come back later and there are just limitations to the internet that the Bible requires of the church that you can't do over the internet. 1 Peter 1, 22-23 says, Since you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. In that little segment of Peter's writing, we see the necessity of the enduring word of God. But he also uses an adjective to describe the noun version of love and says make sure it's sincere, that it's not feigned, it's not pretend, it's not glad-handing, it's not saying, oh, how you doing, brother, and then walking away and saying, I hate that guy. Instead, let it be sincere love, and then he uses love in the verb form and says to do it, the adverb, fervently, on purpose, decidedly. And what's your inspiration to do that? The inspiration is the same as it is with every other command in the Bible. Look to Christ. Look what he has done for you. Discover what he has accomplished for you in that you've been born again, not of a seed that is perishable, but an imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. Love in the Bible is usually a verb. It's an action, and it's an action of sacrifice. That agapao word is a word that is really the kind of sacrificial love that can only originate with God. Human beings just aren't capable of doing it. The best definition for agape that I've ever seen is doing what is best for the person being loved, even if the person being loved doesn't recognize it, doesn't deserve it, because you're doing it as a sacrifice to them. 
And that kind of sacrificial love is what is called for in the church. As 1 John 4.20 points out, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So being committed to a local church is where you learn how to practically love God and love others. Jesus said those were the two greatest commandments. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And the second is like it. You love your neighbor as yourself. Where are you going to learn that? You're not going to learn that on CNN. You're not going to learn that from the world. You're not going to learn that hugging a tree. You're not going to learn that listening to a babbling brook. You're going to have to be in front of the Word of God with the people of God in order to learn the two greatest things you're going to learn in this life. And the two greatest things you're going to learn is to love God with your heart and soul and mind and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And you need to be part of the church to even know that. All right, let's get down to brass tacks, and I'm, yeah, I'm done. Why is the local church important? Because God has left it here on planet Earth to reveal his Son to the world. Even as Jesus revealed God when he was here on the Earth, we now, as the household of God, are called to present God in this ministry of reconciliation. That's why the church is on the planet. The church of the living God, the pillar and support of all truth, is the current expression of Jesus Christ in the world until he comes back. How do you take that for granted? In the epistles, especially the letters of Paul and the things he wrote to Titus and Timothy, it's obvious that Paul clearly could not conceive of living the Christian life apart from being in the church. There are no Lone Ranger Christians in any of Pauline theology. For instance, the elders of the local church are commanded to shepherd the church of God. In Acts 20, verse 28, we read, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And you can only shepherd a definite group or a definite flock of people. This is not a general call to go out and shepherd whoever you bump into. It presupposes that there's going to be a specific flock over which you are the shepherd. It's a defined group of people. When he tells the elders to shepherd the flock of God who are allotted to your charge. Yesterday I read a piece of 1 Peter 5. I'm going to pick up today in verse 7 where it says, You younger men likewise be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. There's that one anothering thing again that is necessary to the church. Clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That instruction for younger men to be subject to the elders presupposes church life. Again, it can't be done over the internet. And then, of course, there's instruction to the elders of the church about how they're to shepherd those people. And then Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they're watching out for your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, because that's unprofitable for you. So in order to fulfill the responsibilities of both elder and members requires a well-defined group of committed believers who are identified as members of a particular local church. They meet regularly for teaching and for worship and for fellowship and for prayer, and they are formally committed to the Lord and to one anothering with each other in order to further the cause of God. The church is the place where you get the teaching. The church is the place where you get the fellowship. The church is the place where you get community of prayer. The church is the place where you are surrounded by people who have your best interest at heart. I don't even have time this morning to get into the necessity of church discipline. But church discipline, just briefly, can only be accomplished 
if there's a church together. Because you can be sitting at home in your jammies, drinking your coffee, watching church online, and you can be acting any old foolish way you want. And the elders of the church aren't going to know it, and there's no way to reconcile you. I keep talking about this ministry of reconciliation. The purpose of church, church discipline is never for the purpose of throwing people out. It's never for the purpose of saying you're wicked and evil and get... It's for the purpose of reconciling people back to the God who made them, the God who chose them before the foundation of the world. And you can't do that kind of reconciliation. You can't do that kind of discipline. You can't do that kind of one anothering. You can't do any of the things that we are instructed to do in the teaching and in the prayer and in the fellowship and in the eating our meals together. We can't accomplish that unless we are, unless we are accomplishing it in the confines of a local church. So what did I come to tell you? I came to tell you about the importance of the local church. Do you get it? Good. See ya.